quiet little town in central Wisconsin. People here are hardworking, no-nonsense rural types. Most of them are farmers. It's a quiet town. There's not much excitement in Plainfield. In the spring, a few bird watchers show up to observe the mating dance of the prairie chicken. And in the fall, a few deer hunters show up to stalk the nearby woods. But the rest of the year, not much happened in Plainfield. All that changed, however, on November 16, 1957. For on that day, peaceful Plainfield discovered that they'd been harboring a monstrous criminal whose farmhouse had been the scene of murder and atrocities, almost beyond description. The man who put Plainfield into the national headlines was Ed Gein, a quiet, unassuming farmer who lived on the edge of town. A nice, quiet man, everyone thought, until he was arrested for the brutal murder of Bernice Warden, a buxom widow who operated a local hardware store. Her decapitated and disemboweled corpse was found, hanging from its heels, in Ed Gein's woodshed. But this gruesome discovery was just the beginning. Further exploration of the farmhouse produced evidence of atrocities that shocked the nation. And the story made headlines across the country. In fact, Life magazine sent a crew and made the story their lead article in the following week's issue. Then reporters and curiosity seekers flocked to peaceful Plainfield. And at first, the locals were open and candid with reporters. But boy, did that change. Once they realized the negative impact of the publicity, they clammed up, and no one would talk about Ed Gein. Despite the bond of silence, rumors were rampant. Was it true that Gein had killed and mutilated over 20 women? Was he a cannibal? Was he a grave robber? Had he made clothes and lampshades out of human skin? No one would say. And the story dropped from sight almost as suddenly as it had emerged. What was the true story? Well, I decided to find out 23 years after the fact. I gathered and studied the published and generally limited data. There wasn't much there. So I headed for Wisconsin to do my own digging. I spent a few weeks interviewing the sheriff, the judge, Dean's attorney, and the people of Plainfield, Dean's friends and neighbors. And what I uncovered was quite incredible. It was worse than most people had speculated. Ed Gein was a real piece of work. And so were the townsfolks, for that matter. Let's go back to November 16th, 1957, the day Gein was arrested for the murder of Bernice Warden. It was a Saturday and the opening of deer season. All the people were out hunting. Everyone except Gein, that is. He had a different kind of trophy in mind. Frank Warden, the victim's son, recalls that morning. He was in his mother's store when Gein came in. Warden said that Gein had asked his mother if she wanted to go roller skating that afternoon. She declined, and Ed left. Warden remembered also that, that Gein had been in the store a couple days earlier and said he'd be needing some antifreeze. Anyhow, Frank left the store about 8.30 to go deer hunting. But later that morning, Gein drove back into town. It was shortly after nine, and the town was all but deserted. Gein entered the warden's store, and Bernice Warden was alone. He asked her for the antifreeze he needed, and while she was filling the order, Gein took a rifle down from the rack in the store, loaded it with a single bullet he had brought with him, and shot her in the head. He dragged the body out the back door and loaded it onto the back of his pickup truck. Then he headed for his farm. Elmo Ewick, Gein's next-door neighbor, remembers that morning quite clearly. He was out deer hunting. He told me that Gein wouldn't allow anyone to hunt on his land. 
It was posted. As luck would have it, Elmo shot and wounded a deer that got up and ran on him, finally dropping on a field in Gein's property. Elmo ran over and was standing over the deer when he spotted Ed's truck barreling down the road. Elmo figured Gein was very upset when he drove past without stopping. So after cleaning out the deer, Elmo went over to Gein's place to smooth things over. When he arrived, he found Gein changing the tires on his pickup. The strange thing was, he was taking off his snow tires and putting on regular tires. Obviously, so the police couldn't track his tire tracks to the ones found at the scene. Gein had two other visitors that afternoon. Bob Hill, a teenager, and uh, later Lester Hill, Bob's father. Both Hills claimed that Ed was acting absolutely normally that afternoon. Little did they know what was hanging in Ed Gein's woodshed. Frank Warden returned from hunting early in the afternoon. He went to his mother's store and found the door locked. He unlocked the door and discovered a pool of blood on the floor and a trail of blood leading towards the rear door. By chance, he noticed the sales journal. And the last entry was for antifreeze. Ed Dean. He said he was coming in for antifreeze. Warden called the sheriff and told him about his mother's disappearance and his hunch that Gein was somehow involved. I interviewed the current sheriff of Plainfield, Buck Batterman. He was a deputy at the time, but he remembers that November afternoon quite vividly. You, how you felt and what you discovered and kind of how things happened. Well, at the time, I was out deer hunting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call to come back to the office. So the sheriff and I went out to his home, and we just got to the home when Dan Chase, the deputy, called by radio and stated that uh, he found out where Ed Gein was. At the Foster's place, huh? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the sheriff told him, well, pick him up. And we busted him down, which is totally illegal today. And but you had a cause for yeah. it. Yeah. And the door we busted in was uh, the back shed, which was connected to the house. Yeah. And it had about a four-foot walk around the house side and the north side, about three foot higher than the ground. The rest was went down to the ground about two feet. Uh -huh. And there was no windows, and it was dark. And the sheriff at that time told me to, to go into the house, and he would inspect that shed. Well, all of a sudden I heard a scream, and he hollered, and I went out there, and Mrs. Warden was hanging upside down with the head off her and cleaned out like a deer. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we inspected the whole house, and uh, another deputy by that time was there by the name of Arnold Fritz. Uh, he took, which is the living room to the house, but he used it as a bedroom mm -hmm. and had the rest of the house boarded up. Right. And I had the kitchen, and Deputy Fritz found this box with, uh, there was six sexual vaginas, right? Yeah, right, yeah. with the women. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there was the, another box with a face mask, in, which we ended up finding out it was uh, Mary Hogan. Right. Who was killed in the Crossroads Tavern. Right. In 55, was it? 56. Uh, it was just before, before that. Yeah, yeah, 54, yeah. yeah. Also in this bedroom uh, was the, hanging on the wall was a plaque of uh, the breast of a woman, fully stuffed and looked as real as hell. Uh, just close that door so people are <laughs> Also one chair 
had human flesh covered you with human flesh for the seat. Uh -huh. We found all parts of Mrs. Warden that day except the liver. Except the liver. Hmm. The state crime lab was called in by the sheriff. They quietly boxed and inventoried the contents of Ed Gein's house. This was done quickly and without leaks to the media. And their findings have been under lock and key for over 23 years. I was able to unearth most, if not all, of their findings. And in terms of human remnants, Judge Robert Gomer, the man who heard the Gein case, expanded upon these discoveries in a recent interview. There's been a lot of speculation as to exactly what the contents were in the house in terms of human remnants. Uh, is our understanding that everything inside the house was carted up and transported to the state crime laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. Would, are you in a position to clarify the issue as to precisely what items were found in the house? Well, there were a lot of things. Thing. He had a sort of an apron that he made out of the front of a woman, which he wore on occasion. There were chairs upholstered in human skin. Uh, there were, there was, of course, without any question, the finest collection of female heads and the genital parts that's ever been assembled in the United States. I'd made some checks on that. Can't find anyone who did it complete a job as Ed did on that. Uh, he had some skulls. He had a great love for uh, noses. He had uh, noses that weren't connected with faces, although he did have heads that were shrunken. Uh, he also had a belt made out of nipples, female nipples. and. Uh, he had uh, these skulls that he had uh, opened or cut in half, as it were, uh, to make them drinking vessels. Going back to the day of the crime, the sheriff arrested Gein and took him to the county jail in Watoma, 16 miles south of Plainfield. After being bounced off the walls a bit, Gein admitted to the murder and mutilation of Bernice Warden. Two days later, he also admitted to the murder of Mary Hogan, whose skull had been identified by an x-ray taken a couple years earlier. A skull Ed had been using as a soup bowl. As far as all the other human parts found in Gein's house, he contended that they were all from bodies he had dug up in local graveyards from 1948 to 1953. I uncovered evidence to make such a contention absolutely impossible. From the state crime lab's report and other facts which were never brought to light, it's clear that Ed Gein killed and mutilated at least 20 women. I got further support for my theory when interviewing Sheriff Batterman. A girl, a woman, a female, 15 years of age. Well, you see, I, I believe this too. Uh, there, at the time, there was a girl by the name of uh, Mary Hartley. Evelyn Hartley in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Yeah, Evelyn Hartley in 1953. Yeah, she was 16. Yeah. It was babysit. Right. And it was found at that time that he, uh, Ed Dean, had spent two weeks at that time in La Crosse. Visiting his aunt that lived yeah. nearby where the girl was babysit. Right. right. Yeah. And about a year, a year after this was all done, we got called up to his property, which was all planted in the pines at that time. A dog had dug up a bone and was sticking out of the ground. And so the sheriff and I went up there and we dug that out and it was a whole body except the head. And this was found on Ed Gein's property. This, and a lot of other evidence, was never made public by the police. Again, I think the whole town wanted it all to just go away. As such, we had Wisconsin's version of Watergate. 
going back to 1957, a week after his arrest, Gein was sent to a Pond State Mental Hospital for a psychiatric exam. Not surprisingly, he was found to be quite bonkers. The examining psychiatrist, Dr. Edward Kelleher, called Gein, quote, a schizophrenic whose symptoms are unparalleled in modern history. He went on to say that this case would be studied as a sociological phenomenon for years to come. What produced this monster? Gein's mother, a domineering matriarch who convinced her son that all other women were evil and sinful. She discouraged dating and marriage, convincing Ed that he should mind the farm instead. His mother died in 1945, leaving Ed all alone. He sealed up the house except for two small rooms where he had his living quarters and his workshop. He stopped farming and collected government subsidies from the soil bank. For extra income, he did odd jobs, but frequently babysat for neighbors. But his loneliness began to foster a sinister appetite, and he started robbing graves. His preference was for robust, middle-aged women who resembled his mother. He used to study the obituaries for fresh victims. The night after a burial, Gein would sneak into the cemetery, unearth the body, drag it home, dissect it, and keep the parts. Psychiatrists explain this behavior as a love-hate syndrome. Consciously, he felt that he loved his mother, but in reality, he hated her for depriving him of other women. Compounding his problems, Gein was a frustrated transsexual. Even as a child, he was an avid student of anatomy. His littered room contained a number of well-read books on the subject. This, coupled with his newfound hobby of robbing graves, he had a first-hand knowledge of the subject. Gein told his psychiatrist that he had wanted a sex change operation, obviously inspired by the disclosures at the time of the Christine Jorgensen operation. Keen also admitted to wearing the skins of his victims when he was alone. They found a vest and leggings in his closet. The apparent lack of fresh corpses prompted Gein to commit his first known murder. The victim was Mary Hogan in December of 1954. After the crime, neighbors remembered that Gein claimed to have Mary Hogan back at his place, but no one took him seriously. What is truly alarming is that there were a number of clear signs that Ed Gein did not have both oars in the water. Lester Hill, for example, his best friend and next-door neighbor, recalls that Gein showed him two shrunken heads, saying he had gotten them from a friend in the Philippines. Apparently, Mr. Hill didn't realize the fact that there weren't any Caucasian women running around in the jungles. And Elmer Ewick, his next-door neighbor, recalled that Gein always talked about unsolved crimes and how the police were, quotes, messing up. And Gein told Ewick that he had Mary Hogan, quotes, down at my place, end quotes. There was only one family in town that had their suspicions, the Clifford Banks family and Effie Banks reported her suspicions to the sheriff, but nothing was done. Aside from the banks, no one ever bothered to find out exactly what was going on behind the dingy drawn blinds of the Gein farmhouse. It's possible that Gein could have continued his crimes and mutilation without interruption, were not for the one small mistake, the antifreeze. Anyhow, after the 30-day psychiatric exam, Gein was committed to the Wapan Central State Hospital, a maximum security institution. Because there wasn't a trial, the facts of the case were never made public, and those who knew, like Sheriff Batterman, wouldn't talk. The Gein phenomenon had its ghoulish offshoots. Ed Gein jokes, that time called Geiners, were popular and maybe the original sick jokes. What is really amazing is that even today the mere mention of Ed Gein's name makes people shudder. He was America's Jack the Ripper.
America's boogeyman. And his legend lives on. After Gein was sent away, the townspeople were enraged by profiteers who tried to capitalize on their embarrassment. One guy bought Gein's truck and toured the country. Another guy bought Gein's house with the notion he could turn it into a murder museum. When the locals got wind of this plot, they torched the place. Interestingly, the fire truck got lost trying to find the house. And no surprise, guess who the fire chief was at the time? Frank Warden, the victim's son. This is all that remains today, in 1981, of the Gein House. What finally happened to Edward Theodore Gein? In 1968, 11 years after his arrest, he was deemed fit to stand trial. Judge Gomer heard the case without jury. The trial was held in Wisconsin Rapids, a small town close to Plainfield. It was a short, non-sensational trial, lasting less than a week. The verdict, guilty. The trial had little press coverage, and the outcome was treated with absolutely no fanfare. After the trial, Gein was returned to a Pond State prison, where he spent most of his time working in a craft shop, polishing stones. In May of 1974, Gein filed an appeal for release. Judge Gomer presided over this hearing. In the end, his request was denied, and he was returned to the maximum security prison. On May 29, 1979, Gein was able to convince his doctors to transfer him to the Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin, a minimum security facility. The courts had no say in this matter. And this is where Gein is today. No bars on his windows. No guards on the grounds. No barbed wire. In fact, no walls. He could walk out down this road tomorrow if he wanted to. Ed Gein, a nice, quiet man. He had a few eccentric habits, but no one thinks he's dangerous now. I talked to his doctor. I guess there's no reason for him to be in a place where there are bars or walls or guards. He's always been a nice, quiet man.